But what's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Community Voices. Today, we got a very special guest, man. We got Bima Williams. Bima, appreciate you tuning in with us. So, absolutely. Right into it. Tell us who you are. Who, who's Bima? Yeah, man. So, uh, so I'm, I'm Bima Williams, born and raised down down south in uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, which is just outside of New Orleans. And uh, I always I always tell people this, but I, I've been in love with sneakers since my goodness since. I was not first. It was the storytelling. It was the marketing around those. Uh, you know, my um, you know my parents had separated at, when I was at a very young age, when I was nine. And I rem I remember. Uh, I think a lot of uh, <laughs> kids that have parents that separated when they were young will get this. But you get the double you get the double gifts on uh, on the holidays. And my dad it was a wrap. <laughs> it was a wrap. And so. Since then, I've spent uh, so much of my time. I spent so many years just that age sneakers, how to get closer to marketing. And growing up down south, uh, that's a real challenging thing because the only thing we really know is retail. I know I knew how to buy shoes before I, I knew how to, you know, make money for myself. And so, uh, lo and behold, I was spending so much time trying to figure out how to get into the industry until I eventually would, but love of sneakers uh born and raised down south shout out to, to all my family back home well that's amazing to hear man especially that we share that love for sneakers i feel like nowadays i'm just kind of i kind of just trying to get what i can because you know that's <laughs> moves and doing xyz i gotta you know pull out an encyclopedia to figure out a question about something i'm just like oh, like you know i just try to get it where i can so yeah oh yeah yeah, so your work experience took you from, you know, the, the big, you know, the big dogs in the retail space. So talk <laughs> about like the, your podcast, Claim Money, mm -hmm. and, you know, how you got to, how did that come into fruition? Yeah, totally, man. So I didn't, I didn't make it into what we call the sneaker industry until I was 26, right? And so I had worked in retail. I had worked at sneaker boutiques. Um, I hung out at skating school, you hang really for your supply from. So, you know, those were the homies. And I had a little streetwear brand and all those things uh, growing up. But I really was curious about, like, how do you work at these companies? And so it wasn't until I was 26, I ended up getting an opportunity to run global social media at Saucony. Uh, so call it, call it Saucony over in Boston. And uh, this was like my first time having this corporate type of gig and environment. And honestly, I'm just excited about the opportunity. I'm not thinking about any of the other things that come with working in a corporate environment, corporate setting. And I remember my first experience walking into this office and seeing it. Um, and you have to understand Saucony is owned by Wolverine Worldwide, which is, you know, they own Sperry, they own Keds, like they own a couple of different big brands, Chaco. And so I'm in this in, in the office in Portland and where Sperry and Keds are. There's about 400 people in this office and I'm the only black guy in this office. I'm 26, you know what I'm saying? So where I come from, from New Orleans, from Baton Rouge, I'm used to seeing you and other people and diversity. I've never been in a situation where I was like the only person there. And the thing about that is it does, it does things to you, right? Because you got to imagine you're, you're, I'm still a kid. Like I know I'm 26 at that time, but you're a kid. Like you don't know what you don't know. And so I'm in that environment and it makes you feel multiple ways, right? Like I, I think for me, the two things that came up was, oh, yo, I'm, I think I made a mistake. I think I need to like, I think I need to go back to Louisiana. Like this feels, this feels weird. I don't know if I fit in here. I don't understand some of the language that they're, they're using when they are talking about these projects and you start to have this feeling like um, you're not, you're not good enough. And it's not necessarily not good enough. It's more so just like, I don't fit in here. And I couldn't do anything about that. I'm six, two I'm black, I'm Southern. Like it is what it is. And I don't have a heavy accent, but I still have things that are just different just because the way that I was raised versus the way some of these folks were raised. I remember like it was, uh, I know you, you're, you're, you're East Coast, but I, I remember moving up there and when it dipped under 65 degrees, I was there in a three-piece parka. So, 
<laughs> but uh, but it, so it, it messes with you and just all of those different things. What'd you say? So that's hoodie weather for us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I, I just started to get to that to that point. Uh, but then the other thing that would happen, and I think um, a lot of a lot of us that have been able to excel in these environments, uh, you you end up doubling down. And what I mean by that is you end up working harder than all your peers. You, you, you spend longer hours. You're trying to leverage your relationships. You're trying to show that no matter what, you know, my background, you know, my race, where I came from, it doesn't matter. I can still come in here and I can, you know, work and put out work better than all of you. And the thing about doing that, though, is it, it has been. And the reason it has a lifespan is because although you're, you feel like you have infinite amounts of energy, this thing called burnout is a real thing. And you could get to a place where you could go so hard for a certain amount of time and then you're like spent. <laughs> uh, but ultimately for me, I did decide to opt for that second route. And I just worked super hard for like three and a half years at, at Saucony. Um, and I, you know, I, I rose through through the rankings pretty quickly, but it did like it did way, way upon my energy and things like that. But ultimately, after that opportunity, um, I ended up going to Adidas and I, I worked there for some time um, in the special projects, uh, brought Donald Glover over and we did a project with him, Childish Gambino. And then uh, in that time, there was a lot of stuff that happened, right? There's This is 2018, 2019. There's a lot of stuff happening in our industry. And really, it's this reckoning around why don't we see more um, Black and brown folks in leadership in an industry that leverages us, that leverages our, our skin, leverages our athletes and our entertainers and our communities to sell product. And there was, a, I think, one of the big moments was this article went out in Footwear News and it was like the 40, top 40, you know, up and coming industry leaders in footwear. And I think there was maybe one or like very few, I think it was about one like black person was on this list and you had this uproar and you had James, James Whitner was speaking out about it. You had Frank Cook was speaking out about it, Melody Asani. And all of these, these thought leaders were just like, yo, what, what's going on here? Like, why, why isn't, you know, why, why are more of us on this list? Because we know who's driving the energy around it. And so I was trying to figure that out. I was trying to figure it out also from, you know, the side that I was in. And I, I'm not a uh, diversity, equity, inclusion expert. I, I'm a marketer. I'm a creative. And so I'm just trying to figure out, yo, what is a different way to understand why we're not doing better here? And if I think about my experience growing up, you know, I grew up in a place where we never had anyone come in and from a corporate lens and tell us what the opportunities were. I didn't even, not even tell us, I just never met anyone to even try to figure it out to spark, you know, searching myself because I'm pretty, you know, resourceful that way. I'm a self-starter. I'll go look it out. You know, if I, I meet Omar, he tells me he does this. I was like, cool, I'll go check him out later. I didn't even get Get that opportunity because I just never was exposed to it. And my folks worked at chemical plants. They weren't, you know, they, they didn't know. They're like, bro, what, what are you doing? You're wasting your time. Go get a good job, get education, like get out of here with all this sneaker stuff. Uh, why do you keep buying sneakers? <laughs> and so um, ultimately when I thought about my experience, it was just that I never had exposure to the opportunities that were possible in the industry that I was interested in, sneakers. I knew how to buy them. I didn't know how to get in the industry. I didn't know what experience I needed to have to be a marketer. And so I thought, what's the best way for us to do that and try to reach other people of all ages that are interested? So many people love, you, you just talked about it. It's so big now that you're trying to stress to get a sneaker. It's like, yo, I don't, maybe I just missed this drop. <laughs> and so thinking about that, um, we decided, hey, what about, a podcast, right? And so this was, it's crazy to think that this was about a year and a half ago. We actually started working on the podcast two years ago. And it's before everything, you know, blew up with COVID and us being home and so many folks starting these podcasts. But we just had this hunch that we have these great networks of folks that we've worked with from multiple brands at all, you know, from all different things, people that design sneakers, people that market sneakers, people that make sneakers with the folks at the factory. And uh, even the collaborators that we've worked with that are outside of these companies, 
And we just wanted to tell the different career stories of how the, like where these people came from. And then how do you get to the point where you're working at Jordan Brand and you're working on collaborations with some of these great people. You know, we have a mutual friend, Nuo Gota, and, you know, Nuo, you know, has navigated this space uh, crazy, switched from finance and then got into sneakers, working at, you know, uh, Converse and then Nike. Um, and we, we just wanted to kind of demystify the fact that, yo, if you're interested in this, like there's a way for you to get in, let us try to give you some insights, just like as James Whitner would say, some free game to help you on your journey. Talk to us about like, you know, that black experience working like in the corporate space, because I gave an example for me where, you know, I started, I say renewal at Commerce and just, you know, going to a space where you're one of like maybe a handful and then probably just one, in the space you're in, because I was in like entertainment, <laughs> and then trying to explain to people who this person is, why this works, why we shouldn't work with this person, X, Y, Z, and then you kind of get like looked at sideways, and you do something great, you know, someone tries to take credit for it, things of that nature. So talk to us about that whole experience for you. You don't have to mention those specific brands, but like that whole experience for you as yeah. a black man working within the corporate space, where it's not so many. Yeah, it, um, in a lot of ways, it feels like you're in a fishbowl, right? Where you, you're in this space where everyone else, it feels like no matter what they do, you know, it's kind of just like whatever, but it feels like whenever you make a move, it feels like you're on this stage and it's it, every single move that you make, it feels like it could be judged uh, good, or, good or bad. And it puts you in a space where, at least for me, where you can't relax. There's no, there's, it feels like there's no moment, no time between the moment you leave your house, uh, when, we, when we could leave our homes, to the, the, the time that you got back in the car and, and got back home, that you could, you could be at peace. And, you know, when you think about that, that is an exhausting, it's an exhausting experience. Um, and, and some of the things that you, you talk about, about like, imagine, being in the room and imagine things like uh, Black Lives Matter come up. And because you're the Black person in the room, they expect you to tell everybody what Black Lives Matter means. And it's like, I, you know, like, I don't, I, I'm not here to be the expert of educating you on what Black Lives Matter is. You got Google just like I got Google. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And so it puts you in this situation because you, it's also political, right? And you don't, Wanna, you want to be a mom a teammate. Uh, you're not a whole teammate. When folks call you, you don't have answers. That's not it. It's more of a, a space of, hey, I just want to come here and do the same work that you want to do. I don't want to be the expert on <laughs> all things of the Black diaspora. Yes, I'm Black, and yes, I love my community and all of those things. And I'm gonna talk about what I need to talk about with my community. That doesn't mean I need to be the educator of the brand. <laughs> no, definitely. And then going back over to uh, Kramer's story. So talk about how, you know, some of the guests we've had on the show, how it's been empowering people of color uh, working in these industries. Yeah, totally. And so when we started it, honestly, we didn't have it was just like, hey, we're gonna educate people on the different opportunities. We didn't know how big of an impact what we were creating was gonna have on, on folks. And so at the essence of what we do is, you know, we've interviewed people at Nike, we've interviewed people at Adidas, uh, folks at Converse, Under Armour, Keen, Columbia. And the thing about it is, a, a lot of these stories have never been told. You've never heard essentially like, hey, you know, there's this young woman named Dom Debnam who's actually about to be 40 under 40, um, you know, in, in Portland. And she was a, she is a, a product line manager, but now she's a senior director of product tennis at Nike. And it tells a story about how she, she was introduced to sneakers and then she met this woman named Brandis Russell, who is, you know, the VP of all of footwear, global footwear at Converse right now. And how if she had never met Brandis, she'd never be in this path. And then she also talked about how 
she, you know, she did all these right things in school and she got out of school and she was working at a grocery store. <laughs> you imagine thinking like, yo, I'm gonna, she did like, you know, she worked at Nike retail and she did all these things and she ended up working at a grocery store for about a year. And it, it wasn't until a couple more things she was actually able to get this gig. And so when you think about some of these things, it also is a part of unlocking the folks that it isn't just a straight, narrow path, right? It's a path that's going to zig and zag and, and you got to be passionate about and focused on where you're trying to go because it's not just going to happen the way that we think or the way that we expect it to happen. And trust me, I get it. Like I, I didn't get in until I was 26. So you think about like, there is so many people that were uh, people that were there, my white colleagues that had been in the industry since they had interned. And you got to see how that feels to feel like, yo, I'm, they got eight years on me, seven years on me by the time I was able to get in and get exposure. It, it, it feels like such a crazy thing. And so what we try to do is we try to, you know, give you an idea of a peek behind the curtain, if you will, about what that experience is like, what is it like to get in there? And then what are these roles? Like, what do you do as a product line manager? Uh, you talk about briefing product or working with designers. Um, so we really want to do that. And what you start to see is we've created this community of folks that yes, they're interested in sneakers, but it's a community of folks that are interested in bettering, bettering their career. And it's not just, you know, this opportunity to just talk about that. It's an opportunity to stay inspired because it, it, it isn't just, you know, an easy opportunity. But then on the other side, I'll have senior leaders that come to me from all of the brands, if I'm being honest. And a lot of them will say, some of, some of them are, 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 are white leaders and they'll say, this has actually helped me understand different perspectives of the peop, uh, BIPOC people that work on my team, because I didn't even, you know, I didn't even know that some of these experiences and, you know, some of the things that they've been through just to get here um, and how they've been interested in these topics, you know, for so long that it's like, by the time they get here, it's like, actually, you might be may way more and more accelerated than we actually knew. <laughs> And lastly, for you, um, you know, you being, uh, I want to say your roots are in Portland, but you're there now just because all like the big brands are out there. Talk to us about um, this one 501c out there that you've uh, been pretty close to. Yeah, so, you know, when we think about this, this, uh, this 5013c, it's, uh, it's Sidewalk PDX, right? And so Sidewalk has been incredible when it comes to the work that they've been doing in the community and also the work that they um, have been doing in regards to sneakers and, 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 and young people as well. And so um, basically out here, you know, they've been doing partnerships with everyone from the trailblazers to boys and girls clubs and, and making sure that folks can get access to the sneakers and the footwear. Um, and just thinking about that and knowing what, you know, our passions are and our mission, um, we're really just wanted to make sure we could figure out different ways to support. And so one of those ways is today by, you know, giving them a shout out. And then just other ways is to make sure we can figure out ways to continue to support the work that they're doing and making sure, you know, folks in our community and the, in the black and brown communities um, have something as, as simple as sneakers, because we all know the reason why we love sneakers, it, it, it's a self-esteem thing, right? It's also uh, something to be proud of. And, when you come from nothing, um, you know, you, you may come from a situation where you might not have the best home, you might not have the best car, um, you might not have the best, uh, you know, the situation with your, with your parents and your family, but sometimes a really nice sneaker can get you through the day. And uh, that's, uh, that's why we, we really want to support Sidewalk PDX and uh, the work that they do because it is really important. <laughs> Oh, yeah, definitely, because, you know, sometimes even kids, like, that don't come from, I want to say, like, as affluent neighborhoods as, like, somebody else would say on, on the Upper East Side, West Side, whatever the case may be, you know, sometimes even for me, like, growing up in the Bronx, like, yeah, I'm not going to say I have everything, but, you know, when I got that pair of sneakers, I felt like I was up. <laughs> <laughs> man, you, I mean, think about it. Like, I remember, man, I'll tell you, I, uh. One, still to this day, uh, I've had, you know, probably over 500 pairs of sneakers in my lifetime. And the, the feeling never gets old. Like, I don't know about you, but that feeling, uh, that new pair that you've been waiting on, 
it never, it never gets old for me. And I'll tell you the, uh, this year for me, that moment was the, uh, the Jordan threes by, um, uh, Amar Meyer, uh, raised by women. And I'm telling you when they came in and the box came in and the whole unboxing experience, I was just like, yo, this is why I love sneakers. <laughs> Yeah, man, definitely. Especially you just looking at that tracking number and you just waiting for it. <laughs> nothing hurts more when it says like package lost or it says deliver and your box. Is <laughs> package lost or you weren't there to sign <laughs> off on it. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, you know, the mission of eSports and Finish Line, especially with Community Voice, is to help elevate voices like yours and, you know, bring awareness to things within like our culture. Uh, ranging from like education to career to you know uh, like empowerment equality and things of that nature so with that said uh, we'd like to donate ten thousand dollars to your charity and pdx and you know continue the work that they're doing and it makes a whole lot of sense considering we're a sneaker retailer and they work they do is around sneakers so shout mm -hmm. out to and shout out to you for your time man we appreciate it so much uh you know again for folks tuning in and checking us out, if you want to hear some more of those stories, make sure you check out the podcast uh, at Claim of Stories. And uh, also, we have a, a really great interview coming up uh, next week with James Whitner himself of uh, the Whitaker Group. And then right after that, next week, we got Jim Ambrose, uh, creative director over uh, at Puma Women. So definitely a lot of bangers coming up. <laughs> Sure, but that's about it, man. You know, again, thank you for the time. Thank you for, you know, what you do with the podcast and just, you know, giving a little hope and some guidance to, like, the people out there who have been, like, in the same positions as us and how to navigate those spaces. Absolutely, brother. I appreciate you so much. Ooh, likewise. Thank you.